Good morning, good evening, um, and uh, hello to everyone across the world. I know we have a very large audience uh, this morning, and uh, it's an honor to be uh, hosting the first panel. As Assistant Director uh, Edward Kwakwa just said, we have some of the leading experts in the world on these questions. And as I said, I'm honored to be, to be uh, moderating a panel with them. Uh, so the plan of the panel is as follows. We have an hour and a half. Uh, we will uh, hear from each of our four main speakers uh, for about 15 minutes apiece. Um, and then we will have uh, questions from the audience. So please feel free to uh, add questions over the course of the next hour. Um, into the queue, and I will uh, pose them to our, our guests. Um, the, the panel is framed around the question of expanding access to COVID-19 vaccines. So this isn't yet the next pandemic uh, problem. Um, it is uh, what is the urgent uh, problem and, and what are the solutions to this problem today? The questions of the panel are, what are the key legal levers to expanding access to such vaccines? Is an IP waiver necessary? And beyond compulsory licenses for patents, what are the prospects for technology transfer uh, of trade secrets and know-how by many uh, vaccine manufacturers to local manufacturers in South America, Asia, and Africa? Can the US force companies to share their knowledge um, to scale production? Uh, and so these are some of the uh, questions that our esteemed panelists will, will uh, take up. Uh, so I am not going to introduce our panelists beyond uh, just their very titles because I would take up the, the morning uh, introducing them. Uh, so uh, our first speaker is Professor Amy Kapsinski. She's a professor of law and faculty director of the Global Health Justice Partnership at Yale Law School. Uh, professor Kapsinski. Thanks so much and delighted to be here with this wonderful group to talk about this incredibly important question. I am gonna share my screen. Anupam, is that looking okay for you? Excellent. Perfect. Okay. So just to jump right in, um, We've had already an introduction to the sort of basic framework and some of the uh, problems that face us at the global level today with respect to access to vaccination. Uh, just a few minutes ago, actually, I was looking around online to figure out where I can get a COVID vaccine for my nine-year-old. Um, there's pop-up clinics. Uh, turns out in New Haven today, I can go take him this afternoon. And of course, um, that's just not the situation uh, that uh, many people at much, much higher risk uh, than my son face in other countries. And it's, um, it's quite a, a devastating replay of situations which we have seen before in global health. And um, the perhaps um, fortunate thing is that we, we have actually quite a lot of experience about how to address uh, access to medicines issues. Now we have vaccines and a lot of our conversation today is gonna be about some of the important details about how scale up uh, and uh, access to vaccines um, operates uh, and, and, uh, and that will be important to, to be thinking about. So, just some basic points to orient us where vaccination is widely available. We, we know that there are massive health benefits, including reductions in disease, hospitalization, and death. We also have very good reason to believe that those benefits will be collective. Right? The more vaccinated, uh, the more likely we are to have both uh, protection from transmission and also protection from new variants. Obviously, part of why we're here today is the vast inequities in global access to those vaccines and uh, many measures of that, but clearly uh, many parts of the world and Africa in particular, very poorly covered by COVID vaccination so far. And uh, just 0.5% of all um, vaccinations have occurred in low income countries. The premise of my uh, remarks today is that manufacturing capacity has to be scaled up. And that is in part because what we have seen so far and in fact, what I think many of us who've been around this block before had expected, which is that donations and bilateral uh, agreements have fallen short of even, uh, I would say, the relatively modest goals that these programs had set 
So COVAX is of course an important initiative and the source of some vaccines for people in uh, low-income countries around the world but it has fallen uh, well short of expectations for many reasons that are probably well known to people in this audience. We, um, we have not been able to historically in other pandemics really rely on donations as a sustainable strategy for access to medicines um, and vaccines. And in this context, of course, uh, with real concerns and manufacturing shortfalls and hoarding or or sort of vaccine nationalism that that problem is is in fact more acute than we've had before so the other thing we know is that there have been many pledges to commit doses both bilaterally and to covax but many of those pledges uh, have not been delivered upon yet i was on a, a panel that i organized with um, david kessler uh, who's the head of biden's operation warp speed and many advocates talking about these problems. And um, he agreed that we have a shortfall of uh, several billion vaccine doses over the short run, let's say over the next six months to a year, um, even if uh, uh, you know, sort of relatively good scenarios um, come through and we don't face new, really big new challenges. Uh, and of course, part of the issue is here that boosters and, and vaccines for kids are now rolling out uh, in wealthy countries, and that's going to stress supply even more than, um, than, than when we had that conversation a few weeks ago. So what are some of the challenges um, to manufacturing that we have to address? One is selection of vaccine candidates for scale up of manufacture. And there, of course, are many vaccines. My remarks are going to be focused on the mRNA vaccines. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is that they have a really excellent profile for global scale up. Um, despite that, they haven't really been a, a, a big pillar of the global response. And that has to do with the fact that the doses that are currently in production have been overwhelmingly pre-committed and purchased by high-income countries. Um, but they are highly effective. They have an excellent uh, safety and efficacy profile. And of course, the more effective a vaccine is, the more impact it's going to have on, uh, on the pandemic. They also have a manufacturing process, which is, has been, um, it's more like a small molecule drug than the uh, biologic creations. Um, and, and in fact, we've seen some of the really very serious production problems that some of the other vaccines, the J&J &J one, of course, comes to mind, have had. Um, and that, um, that degree, I'm getting some feedback now. Are you guys also getting some feedback? Yeah, I am. Um, mm. I'm not sure. Maybe if Sounds everyone could make sure to turn off their uh, microphones. I don't know if anyone else has a microphone on. Um, Sounds a little better. So let me just let me just forge on. Um, yes. So um, so there are there are reasons to think that it's more scalable in manufacturing terms. These mRNA vaccines and can be scaled up more quickly and with less production difficulties than the other vaccines. And that's of course critical. Um, mRNA vaccines, a lot of scientific excitement about them, both because they can be more readily uh, and quickly re-engineered should we need to do that for new variants, and also, of course, our platform that are going to be quite valuable for new, uh, for other viruses. Um, and, um, and just a, a side note, there's been a lot of focus on Moderna uh, as opposed to Pfizer. These are, of course, our two mRNA vaccines um, in the U.S., and, and, and that is in part because of relationships between the US and Moderna, which I'll say a little bit more about, but also because Moderna has somewhat better cold chain properties and therefore um, uh, is, is uh, a little bit easier to use uh, in many different kinds of settings around the world. The other thing that we know is that there have been um, particular problems with sharing of information about mRNA vaccines. And they really are being treated as the kind of Cadillac vaccine that not everybody uh, can, can have access to and the sort of keys to which will not be shared. Um, so manufacturers we know have asked um, Pfizer and Moderna to collaborate with them to enable production and have been refused. 
uh, and that's actually in many regions in the world. So what has to happen for affirmative tech transfer to happen, given the reluctance of these two companies? Well, so one thing is that, you know, my own view, and I think it's well substantiated by the evidence, is that we need affirmative tech transfer, that it's not impossible to do this, uh, to produce even mRNA vaccines, which are, of course, quite new, without tech transfer, but it takes years, right? And that process um, would be dramatically speeded up and in ways that would, of course, have enormous public health implications um, around the world. Uh, and so, you know, our goal, I think WHO and others have set goals that, you know, are, are in the framework of the next six to nine months, say, um, uh, not uh, the next three to four years. And so we need technology transfer which involves a process of communicating person to person, some of it's on paper, um, communicating how to make these vaccines and equipping others to make them quickly. One of the things that we know is that this can in fact happen quickly. How do we know this? Well, it turns out that no company really does this alone. Uh, even the, what we call the, the originator companies are working in collaboration with contract manufacturers and others. And we know from looking at other agreements where they, in fact, have worked with a supplier to transfer technology voluntarily inside of their own contractual webs and supply chains, that they are able to, in fact, transfer technology and scale up manufacture quite quickly. And so uh, there's evidence from these other deals and uh, groups like Public Citizen and KEI have helped to document this. The technology transfer can happen quickly when companies are interested in it happening quickly, um, and that it doesn't take intensive resources. Uh, it takes a, some person power, but not perhaps as much as you might think. Um, and um, and that the so far, obviously, we know that it has been insufficient. And um, and that this has to do with protecting the profit shares and bottom lines of these companies. And of course you know, the, the, the profits that companies have made from these vaccines so far have been very, um, very, very lucrative. Uh, we know that uh, companies like Pfizer and Moderna are earning in the tens of billions of dollars from vaccines, which were a, a very, very heavily subsidized um, by the public. Uh, so this sets up uh, a problem. And so what do you need to be able to scale up manufacture? is you need affirmative technology transfer. You also need freedom to operate around patents at the national level. That's not gonna be my focus today. And I, I know that it'll be a lot of conversation that already has been about the TRIPS agreement and patents and so forth. But what I really wanna focus on instead is how to effectuate technology transfer from Pfizer and Moderna. And uh, I'm gonna focus in particular on authorities that the US government has in this regard because US leverage over these companies is very substantial. And as I just mentioned, given the billions of dollars that the US government in particular put into the development of these vaccines and the particular legal tools that it has at its disposal, I think there's a moral obligation of the United States as well as a real opportunity, both in terms of global leadership, um, but also with respect to protecting the health of Americans to undertake these kinds of uh, steps. Okay, so what are the routes? There's three possible routes, the Defense Production Act, um, the deployment of government patents, and then the deployment of clauses in funding and procurement contracts. And I'll just talk briefly about each of these. So the Defense Production Act is a provision in existing US law. It's been quite important in the pandemic. I can say that probably very few of us lawyers knew much about it before the pandemic because it, it, it is a, 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 a law that exists to support the nation's defense, particularly in emergencies. Defense is very broadly understood and has been amended over many times in this act to um, authorize um, a very broad set of activities. So the definition of national defense, what can the Defense Production Act be used for, includes military or critical infrastructure assistance to any foreign nation. It includes critical infrastructure assistance and protection, and specifically there, um, there's a reference to national public health, and it also includes emergency preparedness activities. The US has been using the Defense Production Act to address the COVID pandemic, and there seems to be uh, clarity that this tool is for, um, in fact, designed for the kinds of needs that we face today in COVID, and the tools that the government has um, and that the Biden administration has on the Defense Production Act are very substantial. And there are 
couple that I'm going to focus on today, something called the Title I Allocation Authority, the Title II Prioritization of Contracts Authority. Uh, there's also another authority, Title III, which in fact gives the government very substantial authorities to spend and purchase and take loans out to build uh, manufacturing capacity here in the United States. I won't say as much about that, um, but I'll focus on these others. So the Allocation Authority, um, under this authority, the president is empowered to, quote, allocate materials, services, and facilities to promote national defense. And materials, very explicitly under the act, includes any technical information or services ancillary to the use of such materials. So very explicitly then includes the ability to allocate. And the Allocation Authority is exactly what it sounds like, that the president has the authority, administration has the authority to require companies to do certain things, to allocate materials here or there. So were we in the middle of an actual war, this would be, uh, enable the government to say, you must in fact uh, send the steel supplies to this particular factory so that the munitions can be made. Um, and it can also um, uh, uh, allocate technical information. And so uh, there's an explicit authority here under the allocation authority to allocate um, uh, these kinds of technical materials. There's also an important authority called the Prioritizing Contracts Authority. So the president is empowered to require performance under contracts that he deems necessary or appropriate to promote the national defense and say that those contracts take priority over any other contract. The US government has taken the position um, and there are regulations that support this, that this uh, not only allows the government to say, well, you have to have this contract be fulfilled before that contract, but also requires companies to accept contracts. And the implication here as applied to our context is that the US government has the authority to say to a company, here's a contract, you have to fulfill it. That contract could be a contract, for example, between Moderna and the WHO's mRNA hub in Africa and say, you must fulfill this contract for a certain number of doses. And the way that you fulfill it written into that contract would be a series of steps. And those steps would involve collaboration and technology transfer. So those are, um, I, I think, really the, the, the simplest way to accomplish um, technology transfer mandatorily under the DPA. And I, it's important to stress that, that companies would be compensated for that. And um, the level of that compensation, I think, would have to be negotiated and should, in my view, take into account the contributions that government made to these vaccines, as well as the contributions that companies have made and the existing profits that companies have. It's also important to recognize that governments do hold um, patents of their own. And in COVID, there's actually a very important, a key government patent, um, the prefusion coronavirus spike protein patent. Um, this was come, came out of Barney Graham's lab um, at NIAID. And this is a patent that is uh, covers most existing vaccines and has what we know so far from reporting on this question and excellent research that was done by a public citizen uh, is that there is um, no license to Moderna. And so of course that means that Moderna is in violation of a US patent with respect to the vaccines that are being sold in the United States. There are potentially hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars of liability at stake because of this patent infringement. And the US has the authority to, um, to insist upon a license, licensing terms could include any number of things, including um, uh, provisions to transfer technology abroad uh, uh, and collaborate with others uh, in, enable, to enable scale up. The last thing is that, that, is that we know um, uh, is that there are funding in procurement contracts. And this is particularly a contract that has received a lot of attention is a contract between Barda and Moderna. A contract which provided hundreds of millions of dollars of support, particularly for manufacturing scale up, has provisions within it that could be used, it appears, to accelerate global vaccine production. And the government has disclaimed this and said that the, the, the contracts don't allow this. One of the difficulties here is that these contracts, as have been all of the contracts that we've been able to get our hands on um, in public, do not, um, they do have redactions. And so uh, there's some level of uncertainty about obviously what's behind those redactions, but there's some possibility that those contracts also give the government authority and, and access to both manufacturing details and data.
So those are those are the, the three powers, all of which together, of course, and each individually give the US government tremendous leverage over both um, Pfizer, but also in particular ways, Moderna, to um, enable the government to uh, insist, in fact, that the company uh, shares technology and supports the global health needs and the national needs of the United States in this critical moment. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Kapsinski. Um, uh, that was a terrific uh, uh, discussion of the current authorities that the US government has. Now, I want to turn to our next speaker. Uh, Matt Kavanaugh is the assistant professor, is professor of global health and, and um, director global health policy and politics initiative um, at the O'Neill Institute uh, He at Georgetown University. Uh, and I am going to turn it over to Matt. Great, thanks, Anupam, and um, thanks to everyone who has organized this great um, this great event. Let me try to share. Can you all see see what I'm sharing now? Well, great. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, just a little bit about kind of the trying not to repeat anything that's been said in the in the previous excellent presentations um, about kind of the politics and the the law that have come into being in the international space um, during the COVID-19 uh, COVID-19 crisis and, and to talk a little bit about kind of how we've gotten where where we are and what our other options are. So first, it's it's just worth noting, as many people have said, um, but but to do so unequivocally, that at the kind of place to start is vaccine equity efforts have failed. Right? It matters because this is a core question. Right? Has it worked somewhat? Has it partially worked? Does it need tweaks? Are we approaching equity? And the answer is we're not approaching equity. Right? There's there's more boosters that have been given in high income countries as of last week um, than all doses in low income countries. And so you know, and and there's a number of questions around this. Does this mostly have to do with vaccine hesitancy? No, it has to do with supply, as Amy mentioned. Um, and does it have to do with a lack of severity? And this, I think, is going to be something that we're going to discover more and more. But the investigations into excess deaths in low and middle income countries show that the vast majority of COVID deaths have probably been underreported in certain countries, such that at the top is officially reported data on your right here, showing, um, you know, showing that there are many, many places where COVID-19 has been the top cause of death in the global south throughout Latin America, but the bottom one shows you that actually throughout Africa and South Asia, it's probably also true. We just don't have good reporting if you just look at excess deaths. And so we are not talking about a situation where the current distribution of vaccines is in any way justified by either the demand or the need. So if that's the case, what should we understand about how we got here? And we'll say that um, that sorry, that as we think about um, kind of within political science, one of the core questions becomes, um, how do we end up where, where we are in policy paradigms? How do they come into being? Um, and what's the agenda? What's on the table and what's not on the table? How has the problem been framed? Uh, what's been talked about as the most realistic option? And then what's off the table entirely and doesn't get discovered. So that's that's what I'm going to talk about. Today I'm going to talk about kind of two core paradigms that we've ended up with as we think about the legal and policy interventions available to us. One is a much more voluntary demand side uh, paradigm that's focused on uh, core questions around um, around the global purchase of doses in a context of expected monopolies for a given vaccine. The other has been an open and supply side focused paradigm that's focused on the global sharing of technology, et cetera. These two paradigms have the same stated goals, but very different visions for the role of the state um, and the use of legal tools. So let me start with the first one, right? So we've got the voluntary or demand side, as I'm calling it, paradigm. This is the dominant paradigm, right? It's an agenda that grew out of a convening of G20 leaders uh, on the 26th of March, 2020, nine months before the very first vaccines would ever be approved. And there, the Access to COVID Technology Tools Accelerator, Act A, was launched at an event on April 24th. And as you can see here, it's a powerful group of governments, private foundations, and global institutions that launched this set of agendas. Co-hosted by the President of France, the President of the European Commission, the World Health Organization, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Act A, what it did is it set up a time-limited collaboration focused on using the existing global health architecture 
right? In order to bring them together, Gavi put in charge, as, as was said in the previous presentation, of COVAX, um, that was the, the way forward on vaccines, along with pharmaceutical companies who were represented by their industry associations. COVAX set the goal um, of, quote, bringing the acute phase of the pandemic to a swift end by, quote, guaranteeing the rapid, fair, and equitable access to vaccines and aiming, quote, to ensure that people in all corners of the world will get access to COVID-19 vaccines once they are available, regardless of their wealth. So as we see here, not, we're not talking about different goals. It's not that equity was not a central goal, but the law and policy agenda behind COVAX, which was based on the preferences of its main political sponsors, was grounded in a set of voluntary interventions meant to organize the demand side, right? So what we have is advanced purchase agreements to incentivize the development of vaccines, pooled procurement mechanisms to increase the purchasing power and leverage of low and middle income countries in theory, negotiations with companies who make the vaccines, market-based incentives for scale up, and appeals to donors to fund the gap for low income countries. The primary incentive for high income countries to procure their vaccines through COVAX, which was an option, was that it would serve as a de-risking mechanism, a quote, insurance policy, limiting the need to invest in multiple candidates. And here, this idea of intellectual property comes in as framed as either A, a key incentive for production um, and discovery, or just not a major issue, not one that needed to be tackled. And either way, um, you ended up with a conversation that was, was saw IP as something that was not central to, to, to address um, in the way in which uh, we would solve the equity problems. And it's very interesting, right? Because here is Ursula von der Leyen, a president of the European Commission, um, speaking about these pieces. And what she says is that the, this kind of mechanism was meant to create a unique global public good. And this is really interesting, right? Because in reality, when economists or policy theorists talk about what a public or a common good is, right? It's one that is non-excludable and non-rivalrous, right? This is a core understanding in, in economics. Um, and yet that is, that is actually not the approach that was taken under this policy structure, right? Um, the, there was no binding or enforceable agreement between states or between com or on companies. That is the core of this policy paradigm, right? Is to not use the power of the state or to have core, uh, core agreements between states that are in any way um, enforceable. And that approach, um, you know, does not actually kind of move a, a global goods approach at all, right? It's actually a voluntary approach, which, you know, is, is in fact the opposite of the idea of, a, of, a, of public goods. Secondarily, there's a core point here, which is that you know, our, our intellectual property monopolies aligned with a public goods approach. And the answer is no, right? The opposite of a public good would be a monopoly uh, and ownership over it, right? And so you know, while there was an earlier statement that without the existing intellectual property system, there can be no doubt that there would, we would not have the approved vaccines that we have today, with all due respect, I don't think that that's empirically clear at all. In fact, as you know, Amy started to say, vaccines have been a massive public investment. The US paid $2.7 billion for the Moderna vaccine. Um, BARDA alone invested $19.3 billion in the development of vaccines. Um, the NIH, as Amy was saying, was, was a partner, a core partner in the development of the Moderna vaccine. And so what's very interesting about that, right, is that, that across the board, whether you look at Moderna, you look at um, BioNTech, you look at AstraZeneca, there was really was the opportunity of a public goods approach. That was on the table as an option going forward, given the public investment and given the role of the state. But that would have entailed a move to a much more open source solution. And that was not the COVAX approach. The COVAX approach is to retain uh, monopolies, intellectual property, trade secrets, knowledge, that they are to, allowed to be kept secret, and that it is up to the companies to decide who will license and who to sell to. Now, this is not the only paradigm that's been out there, right? There is a second paradigm that's been proposed, and this is an open supply focused paradigm, right? Um, the idea of this paradigm was to focus not on supply, but on uh, more on supply rather than demand. That achieving equity, not by sharing doses, but or by signaling demand to originator companies that develop the vaccines, but by removing the monopolies over knowledge and using state power to spur production of effective vaccines by multiple manufacturers throughout the world. 
In this way, the subject of the policy paradigm was not limited doses, but instead knowledge and the transfer of technology from a handful of companies into public and private sector producers, much as was described before. In March uh, of 2020, the president of Costa Rica um, proposed a memorandum of understanding among member states of the World Health Organization on the intent to share rights and technologies funded by the private sector, by the public sector, among all countries in the WHO. That would include pooling patent rights and designs, as well as, quote, regulatory test data, know-how, cell lines, copyrights, blueprints for manufacturing, diagnostic tests, devices, drugs, and vaccines. So this, is, this has been on the table since March of 2020 um, as this alternative way to use law in this way, in which to use the lawmaking capacity of WHO to, to secure such thing. The presidents of South Africa and Senegal joined Prime Minister of Pakistan to expand on this idea in March of 2020, or in May of 2020, in an open letter um, calling for a quote, people's vaccine, right? And the idea here is that this could be complementary to a demand side pooling of procurement. The preferences of key actors in Act A, however, kept these two pieces separate from each other. The different coalitions backing each resulted in very different power. And so as we think right about the kind of how this played out that a month after Act A, the CTAP was, was launched, the technology access pool um, was launched, but it has yet to get a single company or a single major vaccine into it. Um, in October of 2020, as was mentioned, the WTO waiver was proposed by India and South Africa. Um, and it is important to note, right, that this would not actually impact the current intellectual property uh, protections in high income countries. Right, it has been massively poorly reported. Hopefully, folks on this this call will and this meeting will understand that it is in fact simply a question of does decision making on this question rest with national governments, or does it rest on international agreement? And so, creating this waiver is possible, but it has gotten stuck in a never ending loop at the World Trade Organization. And so, you know, and then the third piece, which I won't go into because Amy has really well well described it, is this question of what national governments can do. And so. The options for the US are very clear. So in the end, we end up with these two competing policy priorities, um, policy paradigms. And my point here is that they, while in theory, right, they could have been um, the possibility that they would both equally um, deliver on what we, what we needed, which was equity. In reality, a basic political analysis would tell you that they were not equally likely to succeed in achieving equity. Right? That in fact, um, while multiple policy paradigms could have worked, um, the failure of the demand focused paradigm, which has been what has been dominant, it was foreseeable. It's in fact well predicted by studies in intellectual in um, international relations, in which researchers have studied how do states engage over issues of conflicting self interest, whether it's arms control or border disputes or international trade. We know that the voluntary demand mechanism fails on a couple of fronts, right? One, domestic pressures are incredibly powerful. We're in a period of nationalism. It was launched during the Trump administration. Uh, we, it was launched during the time of Brexit. Of course, there was vaccine nationalism. That the idea that this was not going to happen uh, would, would, was silly, right? High income country governments responded primarily to domestic political incentives that were all about ensuring full coverage to their entire, uh, entire adult populations that paradigm based on the assumption that the global health could overcome vaccine nationalism was bound to fail. Noting also that low-income countries wanted this too. Low-income countries rejected the idea of everyone getting 20% to start. So no one's domestic political incentives were aligned with the proposal that was, that was put on, on there. The openness approach instead says we expect vaccine nationalism. Therefore, we can focus on global production and open sharing of tech so you do not put countries in direct competition over a very scarce resource, but instead allow them to scale up. Um, even if we had a situation where the Pfizer and Moderna were able to move faster, there still would have been an option for low and middle income country production lines. Second, this core idea of public diplomacy that's strategic, right, is, is key. We're looking at what powerful leaders say in international forums is a pretty poor indicator of what they're actually going to do. And there were many national state or global statements that were directly conflicted by what those exact same leaders said. They said they would share 
doses, of course they would share doses. They said at international forums and then domestically publicly said, we are going to ensure that you all get the doses first. So this again was not, not um, imagining, imagination here. And the third is that we have to understand that weak norms will not drive state action without a compliance mechanism uh, to ensure cooperation. And so various high profile events were held where leaders pledged they would share. Um, this was normative work by global health agencies. It was important work, but it held incredibly weak power over the actors who were actually in a position to allocate doses, which are the major pharmaceutical companies based in high income countries. They did not use any basic formal legal or political mechanisms to, ach to achieve compliance with actions to promote equity. International instruments for ensuring state compliance, there's a massive literature on this, right? It ranges from the hard, uh, the hard binding international law with commitments and uh, third party delegation to soft law, right? Commitments that, that uh, states make. In this case, the commitments were even softer than past political declarations on health that have come out of the UN General Assembly. The UK, for example, promoted an unprecedented agreement called the COVAX, uh, Cove Access Agreement, which I think everyone's now forgotten, but it now it did exist. They said this is an agreement. It will, quote, give everyone equal access to the coronavirus vaccines and treatments around the world. But the document bore none of the hallmarks of a significant international agreement. It was only signed by 20 high income countries, and it included only vague promises like commit to the shared aim of equitable access. There were no firm commitments about the definition of equity, and there was no commitment of countries to, for example, prioritize the vaccination of vulnerable people in low income countries before young, healthy people in their own countries. So, so what happened? And I'm, I'll wrap up in just a, just a moment or two, but the, 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 what happened is, of course, this, this level of vaccine equity, right? What we saw was that vaccine equity, vaccine doses have been secured primarily through economic power, legal power, whether that was the ability to close borders and prevent, uh, prevent exports, um, economic power of buying up, or diplomatic power. Um, Israel has secured many doses despite not having production, productive capacity through using its diplomatic power. So where are we now? Is there any good news here, right? We've had these two competing par paradigms. The current paradigm has failed. Might we be moving toward a global policy shift? And so I think the, the good news that I see is that we've seen increasing Southern leadership, regional agreements coming from the African Union and other places, the mRNA production uh, facilities. It's very interesting to note that there's not only in South Africa, uh, we're almost to an mRNA uh, vaccine production, I hope, um, externally created. But in Thailand, um, mRNA vaccine production of a new, new vaccine has actually moved into trials um, that's been kind of engineered through know-how how new know how there. Looking ahead, this failure to build pandemic ready law and policy is really problematic, especially that's politically informed. And so as we think about moving ahead into what pandemic preparedness looks like, we need to think about be thinking about these internationally binding commitments to share pandemic medical know how. WTO waiver just simply doesn't meet this need. It is, a, it is a failed mechanism to respond to a pandemic. We're sitting here, you know, 11 months after the first mRNA vaccines were approved, and we have this level of, of inability to move. Instead, we need a mechanism that encourages compliance, built with the expectation of national self-interest during a pandemic, and we need a model of global public goods that identifies pandemic knowledge as something that's distinct and requires its own approach going forward. I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kavanaugh. I will now turn to Professor Nicholson Price. Uh, Professor Price is uh, a professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School, and he will speak on van vaccine manufacturing know-how and IP policy. Hi, so thanks so much for having me here. This is a, a really uh, fascinating and important event. So I wanna make some points about problems of knowledge transfer and manufacturing and patents and secrecy and kind of how all these things uh, link together. And in, in particular, I think I wanna pull on a couple of threads from what professors Kepchinski and, and Kavanaugh have just mentioned about kind of the things that they set aside in terms of, you know, why is it that like patents don't seem to be enough here. We have tech transfer. And so I wanna spend, at, or we, we need tech transfer uh, and we need active measures to, to drive tech transfer. And I wanna spend at least a few moments talking about well, why is it that patents aren't enough? How might we change this? Like what's going on here? So in particular, right? The idea behind patents is they're supposed to enable the technology, 
the basic patent bargain, and I think Professor Peter Lee is going to be talking about this later today, is the it is that would you give some invention to society and you get an exclusive right. And part of that is giving the invention to society, which is enabling other people to make and use the invention. So why is it that we do have patents that are involved here? And yet everyone seems convinced, and I think this is right, that WIPO uh, waiver initiatives, WTO waiver initiatives, at least the ones that are just focused on patents, aren't likely to do enough because we need more. We need active technology transfer. What's going wrong here? Uh, and the first point I want to make is that this isn't a new dynamic. Um, this is something that we're seeing now that's particularly powerful with COVID-19 vaccines, but it's also the case for biologics uh, and other large uh, uh, complex molecules where we've had you know, products that have been off patents for decades uh, without any competitors, and it's just very slow for competitors to entry, enter. We've seen this for biosimilars as well. Um, so this is a hyper salient problem right now, but it's not a new problem. Uh, so I want to spend a, a moment talking about why is it that patents don't work? Why does this bargain fail? And I think the key difference here is really one of timing, which is that enablement and you know, what you give to the world is measured early. And it's about what is the invention overall. But that's not the product that we care about. That's not the thing that matters economically or to the world here. So I can get a patent on an mRNA vaccine against COVID-19, and that's all well and good. But that patent is going to cover, you know, maybe a particular sequence and roughly what this thing is. But it says nothing about the, the subsequent months figuring out how to actually make the thing. And in particular, how to make the thing which is exactly the thing that FDA or EMA or whoever approves and said, okay, you can inject this exact specific thing and not something else uh, into patients or into people at large. And so the difference between the invention writ large, writ broadly, the kind of thing that justifies the patent and the invention later on as embodied in an economic and public health good, that difference, like that gap is what means that patents don't do what we're hoping they're going to do in this space. Um, enablement just doesn't do it. So, okay. Given that, given that patents aren't accomplishing this, like why is there so much challenge and so much difficulty embodied in that space between the early thing and the later thing? Why is knowledge transfer so hard and manufacturing so hard? Like frankly, you know, part of this, I, I'm entirely willing to say like biology is part of this. I, I spent a long many years of my life doing biology. Like it's complicated, it's hard. There is some inherent scientific hardness in there. Sure, setting that aside, like that's the kind of thing we can deal with. So pharmaceutical companies keep telling us knowledge transfer is difficult. It's really hard that they keep telling us. And so I wanna explore kind of two possibilities here. You know, one is they're lying. And you know, as we heard from Professor Kapczynski, you know, there's some evidence that internal or that uh, sharing with contract manufacturing partners happens relatively quickly. And so this seems to indicate that like, yeah, they, when, they, when they're saying it's hard, either they're lying or they're shading the truth, and it's actually not that hard. Now, I will confess that the quasi-economist in me says that seems weird if it's not hard at all because it feels like the obvious answer is let's do some licensing at just really exorbitant rates and produce tons of it and just make absolute gobs of money by getting other people to make it and just charging very high licensing fees. I don't see why they'd leave all the money on the table but I'm also not somebody who's worked in global public health for decades and people tell me pharmaceutical companies are willing to leave that sort of money on the table. So I'm, I'm willing to believe that that's a possible thing. Um, I think figuring out like how hard is it really demands the sort of transparency that we just don't have, um, which is one, one challenge. So one possibility is it's not actually hard. The other possibility of course is that it is pretty hard. And that manufacturing is in fact quite challenging, doing the check transfer is quite challenging. And so then the question is, well, why? What is it beyond the biochemistry and the biology that makes it hard? And here I think there are some policy reasons that show up. You know, one answer is if it's hard to copy things, if they're idiosyncratic, if they're complicated, if they're complex, and if tech transfer doesn't happen via the patent system, 
Well, that creates longer exclusivity kind of through a backdoor mechanism where if it's hard to copy things, you get more exclusivity, you get a longer monopoly. And the harder something is to do, the harder it is for somebody else to copy it. And so I'm not suggesting that companies deliberately make processes idiosyncratic or particularly hard to copy. They might, but I have no evidence for that. But the incentives are certainly not to make something particularly easy because the easier it is, the easier it is for someone else to copy your exact product. It's also the case that there's very little incentive to develop the fundamental knowledge to understand these processes of production and manufacturing. If you get a product that works and you can replicably make that product and that's what you take through FDA or whatever regulator you're talking about, frankly, that's enough. You don't have to understand exactly why it is the way it is or how it works. And so the incentives to developing the fundamental knowledge as to what is it exactly that we're making and how are just not particularly strong. And in fact, they might be actually weak. On the one hand, knowing exactly what it is creates incentives for regulators to say, okay, well, if you know what's going on, you really got to do it better. And on the other hand, that stock of knowledge out in the world makes it easier for competitors to copy things, to put, not to put too fine a point on it. If Pfizer and Moderna invest a huge amount of money into knowing exactly how manu mRNA manufacturing works, what the best way that lipid nanoparticles is or formed, all the understanding beneath those physical processes. And in particular, if they share that either uh, uh, deliberately or non-deliberately as, as Professor Peraza Ferreña, who's speaking later, uh, will mention, like this kind of knowledge eventually leaks out over time. All of that makes it easier for other people to develop mRNA vaccines, whether they're competitors in the COVID-19 context, whether they're other entries in the platform race to do mRNA vaccines for lots of other things. So it's easy to keep the product is process mentality, not to develop the fundamental understanding and not to focus on simplified things because that makes it easier for everybody else. And frankly, drug companies don't have the incentive to make that happen. I wanna take an aside to say, this is a really dumb way to do innovation policy, right? Like whatever you think about the right reward and this is going back a little bit to Dr. Kwakwa's remarks, like whatever you think about the right reward, the right way to set exclusivity for companies developing products on the front end, whether you think it should be 20 years or 15 years or five years, or we should waive things quickly, or we should support it with grants, whatever you think, it's really dumb to say, we're going to have some approximate non-clear ex back-end form of exclusivity based on it being hard and complicated to make this stuff in a way that doesn't drive us to make it simpler and easier to copy these things. This is a bizarre way to kind of try to set the rewards right. So what do we do? And here I'm thinking a little bit about the current pandemic, but also frankly, uh, uh, thinking about going forward. One possibility is to try to think, okay, well, in the patent system, Maybe we should try to fix this gap. Maybe we should say, rather than just enabling the invention writ large, you have to enable the invention writ small, which is to say kind of a, an economic enablement requirement where you have to eventually enable the commercially substitutable product. It's not enough for Pfizer to say, here's my patent on an mRNA vaccine, go make your own. If you want to keep that patent, then you've got to supplement your filings and say, here's my patent on an mRNA vaccine. And here's my process for making exactly that mRNA vaccine the way that I am using it commercially because that's the bargain and we need to enable that bargain, not just something in COE. Now, that would require a bunch of change to patent law. Another place we could think about doing this is at the level of regulator where we can say, or we could say, probably only prospectively, but I'm willing to, to accept argument on that point, uh, that the regulator can demand disclosure of this sort of information more broadly. Again, we've got regulatory exclusivity, we've got patent exclusivity. We don't need yet a third dip at the well by saying also you can still keep everything secret about how you make this. To some extent, knowledge is, tacit knowledge is made explicit in the chemistry and manufacturing controls of application, sections of applications. And so we could say, hey, you know, vaccine manufacturer, would you like approval to sell this vaccine in the United States and make $30 billion over the next year? You gotta tell us how you make it. 
One possibility, as Professor Kapczynski mentioned, is to tie that sort of requirement in with the initial grants, which makes tons of sense uh, as, uh, as something that should have been done in the context of this uh, particular uh, context. But we could also make this a more generally applicable uh, uh, requirement. And the last thing, or the last policy intervention I'd suggest is, you know, if there's not enough incentive for uh, firms to develop the fundamental knowledge, this again is a place where the kind of public good that Professor Kavanaugh was just mentioning, like this is a place for public support of the development of that sort of fundamental knowledge. Um, there is some of this going on already. Obviously, there is a lot of grant support for the mRNA technology that underlies the current existing uh, vaccines. Work on the production could also be useful. I, I wanted to close just by saying, again, this isn't a new dynamic. And frankly, from my point of view, that's the silver lining of this cloud. The issues that have long bedeviled the industry in terms of why is it that we have this exclusivity that continues on through weird backdoor channels for lots of drugs that affect lots of people all the time. Like those things are getting a new light in the context of just obviously horrific vaccine inequity. And so if we can fix those in that problem, my hope, frankly, and perhaps this is naive of me, is that we can apply those solutions more broadly. And in the, as the problems come to light in the COVID-19 context, we might fix them not only here, but for other contexts in the industry going forward. Uh, with that, I'll stop and thanks so much for your time. Thanks very much, Professor Price. I am delighted to uh, now introduce Professor Artie Rye. But before I do that, I wanna just mention that there is a hashtag for this conference. So feel free to you know, tweet about it or, um, or take pictures and post them on Instagram if that's of interest or on Snap or TikTok. Uh, the hashtag is uh, hashtag COVID IP. COVID IP, very simple. Okay, Professor Artie Rye is well known to every uh, uh, scholar here, certainly, um, and uh, many, many practitioners, I mean, all the practitioners here as well. Um, let me uh, just say that she is a professor. She's the Elvin R. Latte Professor of Law at Duke University, and um, she will be speaking on international mRNA vaccine manufacturing hubs. Professor Rye. Great, thank you so much. I am going to have a few slides um, and share my screen in just a minute, but I really, first of all, wanna thank um, uh, the professors Sunder and Chander for, for inviting me. I am in, in a little bit of a different position than some of the other panelists in that I am working as a part-time advisor to the Department of Commerce. So my remarks will probably have to be less normative than some other commentators' remarks. Um, so that's one caveat. Um, the other uh, caveat is that I'm following uh, Professor Price with whom I've worked closely over many years and entirely agree with so much of what he says that it's hard for me to <laughs> <laughs> follow him without looking like I'm slavishly admiring him. So, so, um, and of course, Professor Kepsinski and Professor Kavanaugh also have said many, many things um, with which I agree. So I will try to be relatively brief. I will also, as um, other speakers have done, speak not just about um, increasing supply in the current pandemic, but also setting up for future pandemics of which regrettably we know there will be many. Um, and frankly, increasing supply, because I'm speaking about the mRNA platform in particular, increasing supply potentially for other um, heretofore relatively neglected diseases um, because the platform could be useful for diseases as varied as malaria and tuberculosis, not simply for vaccines. So let's, let's keep that in mind as well. Um, also in terms of framing, I am going to assume a world as I, and this is sort of in line with my descriptive focus, um, I'm gonna assume a world where at least for the time being, there isn't aggressive patent assertion. So there isn't aggressive IP 
assertion happening um, by the big originator firms that have already been mentioned. On the other hand, also a world in which there is not much assistance being offered by those firms, um, whether uh, because they don't want to, as is probably the case, and, and because the government it's in question, particularly the U.S. government, is not inclined to use the various legal powers that have been articulated so well by Pro Professor Kepstinski. So I'm not saying it's a normatively desirable world, but I'm just describing it. All right, with that as a lot of throat clearing, um, I can start sharing my screen. And what I will do is just a little bit of science, if folks don't mind, um, simply because, let's see, I need to do the, okay, can everyone see the screen? Excellent. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll do a little bit of science and, you know, apologies for those of you who are not biochemistry majors as Nicholson and I were in college and then Nicholson, of course, outdid me and got a PhD. Um, but it's, it's important to keep this in mind. Um, and this is, by the way, um, adapted from work that the Duke Human Vaccine Institute has, uh, has done in terms of the slides that they have used um, for educational purposes. Um, and DHVI is working with the mRNA platform right now, so they're extremely familiar with it. And um, much of what I know really comes from them. So thank you to Dr. Matt Johnson um, from whose slides these slides are adapted. So some of you have probably seen some version of this already. I will be focusing in my talk on the mRNA piece as others have for a variety of reasons that um, Professor Kipsinski has already mentioned, um, scalability and so forth. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that lots of the world is being vaccinated by other stuff. So um, these inactivated viruses that are um, being used in China and to some extent in India are vaccinating a huge portion of the world. Um, they're not nearly as adaptable or scalable, so I agree with everyone that mRNA really does have to, we have to set up an infrastructure for mRNA vet, um, manufacturing that is international, hence the title of my talk. But it, it is uh, important to keep in mind that there are a bunch of platforms and within the platforms, there can be perhaps easier switching between potential vaccines, um, easier switching them between platforms. Let me also say something that recalls what Professor Price said, that in particular, the, the older vaccines that relied upon proteins or protein-like, had protein-like features, um, were really, really finicky. And um, one had to develop the right cell lines and then do the recombination uh, within those cell lines so that they produced proteins and everything had to be just perfectly done. Um, and this is really what's still happening with biologics, um, all those really expensive drugs that some of you um, know about that now constitute 40% of the US biopharmaceutical spend. So, um, Maybe mRNA helps a little bit. Um, it is, so this is the, the messy stuff that has to be done for a, a more biologics oriented approach to vaccine production in this, in this case. Um, maybe mRNA helps a little bit because although we've heard a lot about lipid nanoparticles and as I'll say more, um, in a minute, they are hard. Lipid nanoparticles are hard to hard to make. In the end, we're still talking about complex chemistry, not biology. And so if one can master the complex chemistry, which is an if, but if one can do it, it's a little more plug and play with respect to the mRNA that goes into the platform. And um, you know, we have some groundbreaking science from the University of Pennsylvania to thank for 
uh, making mRNA that doesn't cause extreme immunogenic responses in humans. So as Professor Kepsinski has said, there are real advantages um, to mRNA platforms, and the core principle is really just a very elegant one um, that I want to reemphasize, which is that all you're putting into the human body, excuse me, is this little piece snippet of mRNA, the body does the rest. And so all that messy stuff that had to be done by humans before, human bodies are much better at doing that. And so this is a, a really elegant, elegant solution for which um, I think uh, Nobel Prizes should be had and um, I think will be had. And, and folks have been working on this, particularly Dr. Carrico at the University of Pennsylvania for many decades. Um, so um, fortunately, it came about at about the right time for a major world pandemic, the solution that is from, from her lab. OK, but there is nonetheless complex chemistry. And then there's also the other problem of that Dr. Kepsinski, Professor Kepsinski mentioned um, of uh, cold storage, a um, little bit better for Moderna than for Pfizer, but nonetheless an issue. And that's something that I'm going to come back to. Let me talk just a little bit of the complex chemistry, um, just because um, I find it really kind of interesting. So these modified modified nucleosides, that's what Dr. Carrico from Penn came up with. That was her, I hope, a Nobel Prize winning discovery. Um, plus capping is what goes into mRNA production. There are lots of enzymes and um, resins and all sorts of other stuff that has to be included as well. And chromatography has to be done. I didn't put that in the slide just because it went over one people. But a lot go, has to go into the mRNA production. Then on the other side, this is potentially even more uh, complex and proprietary. The lipids and cholesterols that go into creating the lipid nanoparticle. And then, of course, there's lots of complication in this box, the LNP mRNA box. And there are patents everywhere. I've said that I'm not going to talk about patents because I'll assume that none of these are going to be asserted. But there are patents everywhere over all of these steps. And it's complex. But nonetheless, if it could be made simple, um, which is you know, what Professor Nicholson's, uh, Professor Price's, and my goal is, and I think that it, maybe this could be made simple in a way that um, full-on protein production um, cannot be made simple in the foreseeable future. Maybe, just maybe, that would be really cool. Um, so let's see if there's some possibility for making it simple, not only for the North, but also for the South. So is there some capacity? Well, this is a slide from CEPI. Um, that is based upon a survey they did, which doesn't suggest a lot of capacity right now, at least for mRNA technology in Africa in particular. Um, and that's not good. Um, the, the WHO hub effort in Africa has been mentioned. I'll talk about that at some length just in a minute. But um, it's not good that there isn't a huge amount of capacity right now. OK, so um, can these regional hubs develop some mRNA capacity? So here, again, I want to focus on Africa, where the WHO is focusing. Developing from scratch, three or four years, probably. If Moderna helped, let's say it was Moderna that um, was chosen because of its slightly better um, profile for, for purposes of storage. Um, if it helped, I would say the best estimate seems to still to be 12 to 18 months. So that's, you know, perhaps less optimistic than what um, Professor Kepchinski suggested. I'm not sure. I, I don't know the answer either. But it's still some time, so we're still talking about potentially the next pandemic in terms of a robust manufacturing capacity in Africa. I really hope that happens. I am, I am hoping for that more than 
almost anything <laughs> for which I hope in my lifetime. Um, but I think it will be the next pandemic. Um, so who specifically? Well, here I'm very interested in Afrogen, with which um, I take it WHO is working. This slide is taken from the New York Times, and they're looking at mRNA producers all over the world. Um, I'm interested in Afrogen because it is apparently going to try, even if Moderna doesn't help, to go it alone and try to reverse engineer the LNP mRNA mystery um, such as it is. Um, so that's interesting, and I, I hope that I wish Efrigen every success. The other entity that I think is interesting, although India has not necessarily been as forthcoming with exports at all times as some may have desired, is Genova, which is using um, its own mRNA platform that it developed with a biotech in Seattle. And it's if it can scale up production, that would be really interesting um, because it has all that technology in a different, on a slightly different platform probably than Moderna and Pfizer, but that's okay. Um, how much they'd be willing to share, that will be interesting as well. So those are two players I'm watching in particular of, of the players that were identified. Um, by this New York Times graphic. Um, I add, added Afrogen, by the way, so that, that's, that's not attributable to them. Um, okay, so let me just close by saying that um, I, I do think that we are going to need this capacity, in particular in Africa, um, for the next pandemic. We we'll probably would like to have it as, uh, as soon as possible, even for this pandemic, but I'm, I'm just not as confident of that result. Um, so I will, I will close with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Rai, uh, for a really wonderful uh, presentation, even if the, uh, the chemistry and biology was still uh, very hard for me. Uh, so let me turn to questions and feel free again to add questions to in the Q and A. Uh, so let me begin with a, a question from Josh Joshua Sarnoff uh, for Professor Kapsinski. Um, what would you say about the administration's no, no, unwillingness? No, 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 sorry, no, no. one so, one second. Sorry. Um, so uh, what can you say about the administration's unwillingness to exercise the authorities that you identify? And why have they not done so? What political efforts might be effective in changing these policies, particularly in light of Mr. Kwakwa's implication that major institutions are unwilling to interfere with current reliance on the private sector and voluntary approaches in any significant way? Yeah, it's an excellent question, Josh. And I, um, I think that the, the, the basis of the reluctance so far has to do with a, you know, general governmental deference to industry that we've seen, not just in the United States, but in many other places. Um, and that, I think, comes out of a long history um, of, in fact, sort of decades of that form of, you know, sort of government thinking. Uh, we have to defer to industry and grant industry power and authority uh, so we get the things we want. And obviously part of the, the broader project that I'm engaged in that I think is an important part of the long-term tackling of that problem is helping educate people uh, to better appreciate the really fundamental role that government has, that the public sector has um, in, in the innovation ecosystem and some of the side effects that we've come to accept <laughs> Um, of the amount of authority that industry has, uh, but that have really devastating implications. Um, and so in some sense, I think there's a broad generational effort underway to sort of kind of shift how we think about the right balance of power between public and private. Um, that's like a very complicated answer to a question which is immediate and urgent. And I think the other answer to the immediate and urgent question, what do you do to, to sort of 
encourage the US government to act on this is pressure that comes sometimes, I think, uh, from members of Congress, people in the Senate, right, other governmental officials, uh, and from the public and from advocates who I think can help through media communications and events like this one to point out the real long-term risks that we run as a country if we do not better tackle this problem in, in, on a shorter time horizon than in fact, I think um, we are, are currently doing. And so I think those the, the, there's really no substitute for the kind of mobilizing and advocacy. And I think to take some encouragement of the fact that the, there has been much, I would say more discussion that there was an early wave where the real, the TRIPS waiver got all the attention in the media. Now there's much more attention to the big structural problem about manufacture. And then, and then of course, after that roll ahead of vaccines. Um, I guess the, the, the last thing that I'll say about that is I do think that as um, the US government also gains confidence that we are, heading toward more full vaccination coverage here, there's also more willingness in the government to address this issue. I think they have been obsessed with, and as any national government would be, getting vaccination functional and having all the doses that they needed for their domestic population. And so I do, I have seen in some of my own conversations with people in the administration, more attention than we've seen before to the global question. And I think um, it's going to take more still um, and more pressure to kind of overcome the inertia and, and the fear of industry power that I think we see all over the world, but also unfortunately still in the US government. So um, thanks very much. I wanted to turn to Professor Kavanaugh. So we had a question actually that was directed towards um, Director Edward Kwakwa um, uh, from the earlier keynote. Um, where one of the uh, our, our guests uh, asks, uh, Abhishek Kumar says, uh, with respect to Professor, with Director Kwakwa's suggestion that um, nations should be exploiting TRIPS flexibilities to a greater degree, um, one of the arguments that uh, Abhishek Kumar says is that nations aren't doing so because. Uh, developed countries are putting pressure on uh, developing countries whenever they do exploit such flexibilities. But perhaps another uh, answer would of course be the tacit knowledge that uh, Professor Price was speaking about. Um, it's even though uh, Professor Rai told us about uh, one company that's trying to reverse engineer it on its own, uh, it, it might be hard to reverse engineer these things. So I'm just curious what you think about the flexibilities and the realities of that process? You know, it's a great question, thanks. So I think, I think a few things. One, um, you know, it is certainly the case that when we see um, low and middle income countries exercising TRIPS flexibilities, despite all of the conversations around how this is an acceptable uh, built-in part of the WTO agreements, what we see is um, high income countries, including the United States, putting massive pressure on these companies, right? It is, it is or countries rather. It's, it's notable that some of the most bold use of compulsory licensing was a decade ago um, in HIV HIV and heart medicines when the Thai government issued a series of compulsory licenses and all it took to have the Thai government really issue bold compulsory licenses was a military coup and global, uh, you know, global uh, scorn for what was happening because the democratic government felt too nervous to issue these compulsory licenses because of all the pressure that would come from the United States government, which was a major political supporter. When that political support was in question, all of a sudden the military government said, ah, actually, maybe we should issue these compulsory licenses so we can't afford these medicines. And so it's just, it's, it's really, they get put onto special watch lists. They get, uh, they get sanctions threatened. Um, the very nature, I would argue, of the bargain that was supposedly struck at, um, at Doha, um, where countries are supposed to have this kind of global policy space, has not been upheld by high income countries. And I think that's really important to, to note. The other part that, uh, that speaks to Professor Kapczynski's points earlier is that in theory, if the system were working well, we'd be in a situation where 
you know, the, the know-how had been disclosed to the point at which someone with, you know, state-of-the-art knowledge could make these vaccines, uh, you know, based on what's been disclosed. But we're nowhere close to that, right? And this is notable in the fact that you have some of the world's leading scientists in Thailand and South Africa who are currently sitting down in our mRNA hubs. They have production capacity that's substantial. They have, you know, cutting edge um, technology and know-how behind them. And they are not able to simply take the existing know-how and, and uh, you know, put it in, into practice if there were a waiver through a compulsory license. They just can't um, because of the way the disclosures happen. So what we need is this technology transfer but I would argue that that signals um, a kind of failure of the system to do the basic pieces, right? If, if, if the system were working as, as imagined, then, then Thailand could tomorrow issue a compulsory license and make the technology because they're literally making mRNA vaccines today and share it with the region for all the other countries. The, the, the technology exists, the capacity exists, but they simply are missing the know-how because it hasn't been, been disclosed. So I think that these are key pieces going forward. So Julia Barnes-Wise asks a question that I want to put to Professor Price. Uh, what incentives do any of you guys suggest, Professor Price, I'm putting this to you, uh, to support the increase of voluntary partnerships between manufacturers and potential, potential new regional manufacturers and ways to address disincentives such as liability and shortage materials? And Professor Rye, if you want to also address some of that as uh, after Price, I would, uh, Professor Price, I would be grateful. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm kind of, I'm kind of baffled that there isn't more uh, voluntary partnership already. Like, it's hard for me to get this, just because when I look at the, the, the what seem to be to be the economics, it doesn't make sense that we wouldn't already have these voluntary partnerships, unless, and and the most. So I, I think the most likely picture I can imagine for why we don't have voluntary partnerships and why it's not just Sorry, let me take a step back. Leaving money on the table only makes sense if you think that taking money from the table is gonna leave a lot more money on a different table. And so if the answer is that pharma is not willing to share, big pharma in the rich West is not willing to share with partners to take a bunch of money off the table because they can't currently make enough for poorer countries and they could take a big slice of it and they're not willing to do that it seems like the most an likely answer is because they think they're gonna to make tons more money next year or the year after or whatever by keeping an approximate monopoly on vaccine production tech or on vaccine production platforms. That strikes me as the most likely explanation for why the economic story doesn't pay out now. I'll say a couple of things in response to that. The first is what that suggests is that an incentive structure trying to overcome that is unlikely to be particularly successful. Because if the answer is just, we're gonna double the payments for the vaccines that you send to Africa, that's not gonna do it. They wanna keep the knowledge. The second is, this depends on the idea that there's actually something so hard about getting mRNA vaccines working, qua mRNA vaccines, not this particular COVID-19 vaccine, that they think that they're gonna be able to keep something like monopoly on this sort of platform technology. And the questions embedded in that question about, or, or in the last response about, you know, uh, uh, scientists in Thailand making mRNA vaccines right now, you know, to the extent that that's really also using this platform, that suggests that this strategy by Big Pharma is likely to work, not likely to work. So maybe we shouldn't worry about it so much. I don't know. The last point though is, if incentives aren't gonna be useful here and, the fact that what we're seeing happening is happening suggests that they might not be. That suggests a bigger role for the kind of thing like mandates and requirements and writing things into the uh, uh, contracts or into FDA standards to, to say like pouring money at this isn't gonna work unless it's just truly astonishing amounts of money, um, which frankly is politically unlikely. Great, Professor Rye. So I agree with a lot of what Professor Price has said. I do think it's um, the fear of taking future money off the table, including future billions that you can't even imagine. Um, and and that's, that's the sort of thing that would make uh, firms have to answer to their shareholders and so forth and so on. So um, 
I am actually going to add one piece to the uh, the, the puzzle, um, which is potentially by way of question, but also potentially by way of solution, and that is. I don't know why it is that for the mRNA production mechanisms in particular, it would be so difficult for there to for a publicly entirely publicly funded organization to acquire that technology. Um, probably, you know, easy, more easily in the U.S., but certainly in other countries. I Again, I, I want to go back to Genova for just a second, because Genova is an Indian company that was founded by an ex-NIH scientist. Um, he's working with a small biotech in Seattle, and they're doing a completely different approach, not completely different, a different approach to mRNA-based manufacturing, which will allegedly not require um, cold storage. So I am a little puzzled by that, just the existence of something like a Genova. Why can't those smart ex-NIH scientists or even NIH scientists, because that fellow came from NIH, um, do this? Yeah, um, those are all great questions. Can I ask someone about if any, either, anyone wants to take up the liability question. Um, one issue that we've seen um, for, say, Pfizer's vac vaccine exports is a requirement that the government indemnify the, the company for any drug exports to that country. Um, India, as, as I understand, has been unwilling to do that. Um, what do you guys think about you know, indemnifications in this context? Maybe just to briefly briefly come in, you know, one of the things that we were here kind of talking about um, about IP, but of course, as we've talked about in several ways, the monopolies are not simply IP monopolies, right? They're also knowledge monopolies. They're also capacity monopolies, and so so they're operating in these very um, you know multi sectoral contexts. And the the distortion that that's giving is not simply that companies uh, the countries can't access the the technology and can't produce, but it's also creating a massive global distortion in power between um, between you know sovereign states and companies, right? That in a normal tender, if we were tender for something, there would be, you know, competition, uh, there would be transparency, there would be all of these things in the creation of, of especially when you're spending billions of dollars, um, you know, and for low and middle income countries that have lower power, they have been pushed into agreeing to many things that they would not otherwise agree to. And this is why we need to think about these things, I think, separately in a pandemic than we would in the normal course of a business, right? Because companies, our countries are, are signing on the dotted line for a number of compensation requirements um, that they wouldn't otherwise do, right? Uh, the no-fault compensation system and, uh, and waiver of liability that makes sense for the United States probably makes far less sense for uh, a bunch of middle-income countries uh, who have different economies and different economic structures and different legal structures. And yet the companies are essentially able to say, please, through the contracting process, make new law right? Create a compensation system through the contracting process. And if you don't, then we won't sell you the vaccine, which would not be a problem in a context of competition. But in a context of monopoly, it means that companies, countries largely have no, have no option. So we're, we're going to find out when eventually all of these, these contracts are, are revealed and the legal infrastructure below them um, happens, is we're going to find out that we actually created a massive amount of new law in uh, when it comes to compensation systems uh, through this contracting process, some of which will end up passed by parliament, some of which won't, um, but, but it's going to be a really complex environment. And this is the, the kind of fallout of the monopoly realities. And so I think that's why a pandemic, kind of a broader pandemic understanding that monopolies are, are bad for the, the urgency uh, politically and legally is, is really urgently needed. Thanks. I love the reference to contracts here because there's tort and contracts and all these things going on. And uh, Professor Kempsinski, Professor Price have also mentioned the kind of procurement arrangements um, in uh, the in in potentially you know that what what our deals were for these particular vaccines in the first instance as well. So contracting all around. Um, 
Uh, I want to come back to Professor Kempsinski. You talked about the U.S. government's authorities. Uh, Professor Houchin's son asks a question about a particular authority that you mentioned that relies upon defense, uh, national defense. What is the scope of national defense here? Is this something, can we use national defense to support, uh, you, know, you know, to mandate vaccine distribution in Africa? Right. Um, so, so one one question that some people have asked is, does national defense cover health? Um, and and I think you know there it's helpful to just look at the text of the statute and the DPA. And I put some links in the chat if people are interested in sort of following the thread. And if you, if you check out those pieces, you'll find some links to the actual statute. Um, and the statute has a very, very broad definition of national defense. And of course, if it didn't, we would have trouble doing what we've done so far, which is to use the Defense Production Act to address shortages of ventilators and masks. And actually, um, uh, it's been in the background and we know from reporting that the US government has actually relied upon it um, in some of the contracting that's done around COVID vaccines, sort of knowing that it's there in the background uh, um, as, a, as an authority. and you know, um, could facilitate uh, the kinds of transactions that it's engaged in already. Um, so that's one piece. And I guess the other question is about is application abroad. Um, so is there any particular reason to think that we couldn't use um, the Defense Production Act to work on questions uh, or sort of to work on allocations uh, across borders? Um, the, the Defense Production Act does have a component of it that says, you know, it's, it applies nationally, territorially in the United States. Of course, that's sort of in some sense not a surprise because the U.S. government, you know, doesn't have the authority to, uh, you know, tell other, you know, let's say manufacturers that are located in other countries what to do. Um, and so if you can dig into the, the, the legal language and the history, um, you know, I, I think it's um, not problematic to use this in terms of a kind of a global set of global contracts, in part because Congress uh, um, did make some changes to the Defense Production Act to talk about providing critical infrastructure assistance to foreign nations, for example. We have, we know of some examples um, where the U.S. government seems to have used the Defense Production Act to say you have to do this vis-a-vis -vis our foreign partners. Um, and so um, the US government seems to take the position uh, as I think it can under the statute that, you know, as long as it's in the national defense interest, and obviously some of the parties are in the United States, that it can use this um, more broadly to have an impact on, um, on relationships and critical uh, infrastructure to foreign countries. Um, a, high, a, you know, a highly conservative version of this is also possible where you say, well, first transfer this to the United States government inside of the United States. So transfer this information to BARDA. And then BARDA can do what it wants, right? So if you felt like um, you, you wanted to be conservative about the national nature of the, the law, you, you could do a sort of two hop version. That's actually not unlike what has happened with some of the technology transfer around influenza vaccines, where BARDA has been involved, um, but might not be as efficient um, as other ways of going about doing this. Great. Um, I'm going to. Uh stop our panel here just to keep on time and um, give everyone a break. There is a tremendously impressive panel uh, coming up and I wanna just mention that panel just because uh, it, it'll be at 10.45 a.m. Eastern time uh, and it'll be moderated by Professor Houchin's son. It will have uh, Professor Lawrence Gostin, who is well known uh, again to everyone in this area, uh, uh, Professor Funmi Arewa, uh, a real, really wonderful uh, uh, and knowledgeable speaker uh, and scholar, Calvin Ho at the University of Hong Kong, and uh, my former colleague, Peter Lee uh, at UC Davis, who will be speaking on tacit knowledge transfer, exactly some of the stuff that we've talked about and he has written so uh, deeply about. So I want to now thank the panelists for an enlightening conversation um, and, uh, and uh, look forward to, this will all be available um, on the internet with closed captioning in, in a, a week or so. Uh, so uh, I encourage you guys to share it in the future as well. Thank you.